Hey everyone, welcome again to another 360 Timmy. Today we're in Central Park in New York and I'm joined by David Ippolito. Now this, space, this place is very special for David. He's been performing here for 32 years in Central Park with his right. guitar, so you are the guitar man. Right, well I was that guitar, man. that guitar man because it's less pretentious. <laughs> it's like, are you the guitar man? No, I'm that guitar man. And we literally normally start this podcast by walking, but we're stationary at the moment because we're looking up at the hill ahead of us, which was your audience, and right. this fantastic backdrop where we are now with uh, the skyline of, of Manhattan behind us. So right. let's take a walk, and, and how did that come yeah. about? Let's, let's uh, discover whatever, your background. Whatever I should yeah. say, David is a singer, songwriter, playwright, Crazy, right? and uh, activist. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just want to explore your story, David. Tell us, yeah. tell us all about how it, how it started. I will. Let me just say hi to these guys. You guys are great. <laughs> and those guys used to warm you up. Well, yeah, they, uh, by accident. They, oh. um, they, no, Did see, they keep all, stopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, they, they, over the years, there have been, because it's a permit situation, there have been other musicians, it was kind of like the Wild West, whoever got there first, you know. Um, but for the past, oh God, since 2000, so that's, that's 23 years. It's crazy, isn't it? How quick it's it is. crazy. Um, um, I've had the permit, um, but every so often there's another group of musicians or somebody that want to move in. These guys, and most, most have been really nice, these guys are just nice guys and just say, hey, we got the permit, we'll start at one, but finish up, do whatever you want. So they started coming earlier and they play. It's kind of, it's kind of like a nice classical warm-up band. It's kind of cool. <laughs> so what, uh, what got you playing in Central Park all those years ago? Uh, well, I, I've told this story a thousand times, but um, I tell people that about 33 years ago, after the sex, drugs, and rock and roll years in the village, um, I, was a, I became a failure as a human being in every way you could possibly be. And um, and because uh, I was a drunk and I was trying to do my body weight in cocaine and was homeless and just a mess. Um, that all changed in 91. Uh, and I really wanted nothing to do with music. I wanted nothing to do. At the time, I think I still had dreams of being an actor. And I didn't even understand what acting was. I didn't know how s simple it was. I didn't know, because I didn't know myself. But I wanted nothing to do with that. I just wanted a simple life where I didn't have to feel so terrible all the time. And uh, anyway, so the, the the drinking stopped and the and the drugs stopped. And but and the way I describe it is, it's like I was born I was born an artist, and so there's nothing you can do about that. I, I um, when the lights in the building start coming back on. If you're a painter, you've got to paint. If you're yeah. a songwriter, you've got to write songs. If you're a playwright, you've, if you're a storyteller, you've got to tell stories. It's just what you have to do. It draws you in, doesn't it? I think Robert Louis Stevenson, I'm not sure, but I think, I think he said that human beings are not really free to deny the thing that gives them the most joy. And of course we are, we can make choices, but I think what he meant was there's misery on the other side of that. If you're not at least pursuing what gives you the most joy, what's the point, you know? And um, anyway, so that, that spring in 1992, I just say the lights in the building start coming back on. And I, I thought, well, maybe I'll just, I was working in a restaurant. It's funny, my first sober job, I was working as a bartender and a waiter. Um, what, and what did you originally want to be uh, uh, back when you were a young man? What was what was your goal? Uh, then? I, you know, a creator. Yeah. I did. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I was when I was. I was you see, you don't have enough time. When <laughs> when, <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, 
Well, let's go around these guys. Um, when I was a kid, I drew the fire truck in kindergarten that looked like a fire truck. I drew, I was an artist and um, I could just do that. I, yeah. was, I was an artist. Um, my mother and father, my dad was a New York City firefighter, you know, with five kids. He didn't have a lot of money, but they must have recognized something in me. Um, I had four sisters in me and they must have recognized something because one day when I was seven years old, my father said, David, would you like to play the guitar? And I said, yeah, and I had no idea what that even meant. Um, but he uh, took me to a music store and bought a guitar. I'll never forget it. It was $24. At that point, I had never heard of anything that cost that much money. Um, so I was amazed. And actually, I looked it up. The equivalent today is like $240. Okay. Um, well, this is 1963, maybe, or, yes. you know, whatever. So, so I get this guitar, and they got me lessons, <laughs> half-hour lessons, where I had to also practice for 30 minutes a day. Now, to a kid, 30 minutes is like a day. So I'm doing this thing, and the mathematical side of my brain doesn't work anyway. So they're trying to teach me how to read music at seven years old, and I don't get it. And I'm practicing, and I'm crying, my fingers hurting. It just wasn't in the cards. And then the next year, was it the next year, I'm in second grade, and the two, there were, I'm in second grade, there were two guys in the neighborhood that were like men. They were in fourth grade. Uh -huh. So they were the big kids. And they were talking about something that was going to be on the Ed Sullivan show. Oh, yeah. Called The Beatles. And, and I'm listening to them and I'm like, this sounds fascinating because I'm picturing, I'm eight years old, I'm picturing real beetles, the actual insects. <laughs> and they're saying that they sing. And I'm going, Beatles that sing. So I'm begging my mother to stay up and watch this on a Sunday night because I couldn't stay up that late. And she, of course, she knew what was going on, but she didn't know I was picturing these Beatles. Um, and Ed Sullivan, and here they are, the Beatles. That's a classic right? clip, isn't it? That? Really and exciting. suddenly there's these four strange looking people and the first song they did was All My Lovin'. Now, up until that point, in my little eight-year-old brain, I had heard rock and roll, but rock and roll was boom ba doom 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 or it was dum 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 All of a sudden, these everybody's screaming, and these four guys go, close your eyes and I'll kiss you. And John, I didn't know at the time, was playing triplets. That da 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 close your da 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 I had never heard anything like it. I was, must have been like my brain melted. I was like, whoa. But I was the guy with the guitar. So I went upstairs, that, well, the next morning, I got back from school, went, grabbed the guitar, and I found out that I could just play it. I didn't need music. I didn't need lessons and oh, stuff. You literally can I could just and, you can and play it. That's incredible. Yeah, so I was, that's what I mean. I was born an artist. I could just draw pictures. I could just paint. I could, and suddenly I got the guitar and I could just play it. Yeah. So that was kind of, if, if that's who you are. And you found your stage here in the park. Well, yes, that's another long story. Um, I started bringing the guitar to school, you know, for little assemblies and things and parties and and I'm playing Beatles. I wish I, I wish there was video then because seeing this little eight, nine year old kid singing Beatles songs must have been hysterical. Yeah. But, um, but then I met, a, I inspired a guy, a kid of my class named Philip Grandy and he got a guitar. So. And so the two of us started a band like in fourth grade. <laughs> And we started playing, I, th I think we might, for our age, we must have been pretty good. And we got a little drummer and we got a bass player. 
So fourth to like eighth grade, um, me and Phil Grandy are, are, are rock and rollers. I mean, it was just nuts. Um, in a Catholic school, go figure that. Wow. You know, and that's coming from uh, the way I describe myself now is I'm a an agnostic who is working really hard on atheism. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just I kind of go to the church of I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not even sure about atheism, but I want to be. But anyway, so back then we're doing these things. Phil Grandy, interesting for your audience. <laughs> Um, actually had more courage than I did, um, because, and I shouldn't say that, I wasn't, I wasn't an artist trapped in a New York suburban life. Because you were in the Hell's Kitchen, weren't you? Well, no, that, no, at that point, oh, let's go, rewind, I was, my dad was a New York City firefighter. Yeah. And, um, which way do you want to go, by the way? Uh, uh, you're, you're, the, you're the man on Central Park, so. Well, I guess uh, we can, let's see. Um, we can go a big loop in the park this way, or we can go down to Central Park South. That might be cool because you'll see the Plaza Hotel and everything. Let's do that. Right, yes, let's do that. that sounds good. Um, anyway, my dad, I was born in New York City, but, um, and, but my dad was a kind of a remarkable guy. How's it going? Oh, good, man. Um, um. Keep your eye out for all the obstacles here, don't you? Right. Uh, horses. <laughs> Everything. Scooters, cyclists, pedestrians. <laughs> and these guys, the pedicabs are relatively new. So some of them are like that guy, just friendly and nice. And some of them are just wild. But anyway, so my dad, um, he, he was a remarkable man. Um, I can say this about my father. Uh, two things. I'm, I'm in my 60s now, and I've met a lot of people. But I don't think I've ever met another man to whom it was more important that he be a good man. Yeah. Um, now, the result is not for anybody to judge. You know, he had his shit. <laughs> but, Everyone does, but it was important to him to be a good man. Yeah. And the other thing I can say about him is that to this day, I don't think I've ever met a man who kept more pain inside him. And, you know, he was that World War II generation, yeah. but he just, and it would come out sideways in lots of ways, you know, that aren't healthy, aren't, you know, but he kept a lot of pain inside him and he tried to be a good man. Um, but anyway, so he, uh, when I was little, it, like everybody else uh, in New York City, like a lot of people, got on the caravan and moved either to New Jersey or Long Island. Yeah. We moved to Long Island. Right. So okay. I'm a little kid. I'm out on Long Island. Uh, and uh, and so I've, I went to Catholic school for eight years, knew by 12 years old that this was horseshit and I'm, <laughs> I, I'm just not doing it anymore. Um, and I didn't even have the courage to tell my parents that I just didn't take the test for the Catholic high school but but I, I thought kind of lost track of Phil Grandy after after elementary school until I, I met him at a party high school party or, or maybe even later and he had dropped out and moved into New York to become a session player a lead guitarist and he was good and um Right after high school, I became an artist, a commercial artist, because it was the next thing to do. I, you know, I was, I went to college for 10 minutes. I, I didn't belong in college. So I become an artist and I meet Phil Grandy at this party. And of course, you know, we're drinking and laughing. And, and I said something like, well, look at us now. I'm calling myself an artist, but I'm getting a paycheck and I'm, just, just an asshole. And Phil looked at me with a look I will never forget. And he went, oh, I'm not an asshole. <laughs> and it was like getting punched in the stomach with the truth. I was like, you're really doing what you love. You're really going for it. Fast forward again, Phil became Joe Cocker's lead guitar wow. player. 
I, I start seeing Phil on The Tonight Show. I start seeing Phil on, you know, in concert. Um, but Phil and I were very similar in that he also had those demons. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Phil died a few years ago. Um, they found him because he didn't get as lucky as he. You know, he just, he kept living that life. But, but anyways. <laughs> but, but he must have, um, he must have inspired you, you know, well, get into that position with her. Yes and no, because I mean, there was a long time. And maybe it's the reason I drank so much. I don't know. Um, but I didn't leave the art department until I was 27 years old. And I thought to become an actor. And one, see now, one of the reasons I always say that, you know, my mom and dad, they were really remarkable people in, in so many ways. And I'm not saying that because they weren't my parents. They were not perfect. They had their shit. But, but I was in the art department one day and I thought, maybe I'll see what this acting stuff is about. So I, I got out the phone book, remember phone books? Yeah. And I opened it to A, and I saw a place that said American Academy of Dramatic Arts, in bold, it began with A. And I called them, and they said, well, we have auditions. Um, we have actually an opening next week, or we start again in the fall. And so I said, I'll call you back. And I called my father for some reason, and we didn't have that kind of relationship where I would bounce stuff up, but I just called him. And I said, hey, you know, Pop, I'm thinking about maybe, I don't know, seeing what being an actor is about. And they got this audition next week, and they got one in the fall, and I'm just kind of thinking, and he said, go next week. Um, <laughs> who is this? And uh, I said, really? He said, your mother and I always felt you belong in the arts and more than just in an art department you belong creating things you should be in the arts but we could never it had to come from you we could never say that to you because it can be a really difficult yeah. road you have to find your own expression don't you I guess. and yeah I, I don't know but i was like parents will surprise you if you give them a chance i, I mean mine did and um and so i left the art department to become an actor supporting myself as a musician in the village and that's the sex drugs and rock and roll years it was crazy but it was fun it was really fun until it wasn't yeah you know it was magic it was the kind of life that people make movies about until it was really ugly yeah until and that's just it's what killed Phil it's and many in the, in and the, yeah, the, and yeah. Prince and yeah. Tom Petty and, and, and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 So. so, but I got lucky. Anyway, I don't even know where we were or what we're talking about. But well, you're getting to where you uh, how you ended up in Central Park. Oh, okay. So, yeah. th so then um, I did the acting thing for a while, and I was doing you know soap operas and little things. Um, <laughs> I had the occasional. Yeah, I wasn't even really doing theater. I did. A, I don't sing well enough or dance well enough to do anything in musical theater except the lead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because because, <laughs> because I was an actor, and I, by that time I did get what acting was about and how simple and mysterious it is. Um, but so I, I would go out and do these shows, and then you know come back penniless because I was a drunk. But. Um, but I was su supporting myself as Uncle Dave and Bob <laughs> in the, or Uncle Dave and MV at the Red Lion in the village. Um, I guess for about seven or eight years, it's all a blur. Yeah, What's the, is the Red Lion a bar? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, again, it's a whole nother podcast. The Red Lion <laughs> wouldn't be there. Um, do you want to walk by the plaza? Yeah, can do, yeah. Yeah, let's go this way. Um, um, the red line wouldn't be there if I wasn't born, and that's a whole nother story. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll have to go. Is it still? It's still going, is it? Yeah. I'll have to go find that. Where else is that? Uh, Bleecker Street and Thompson. Okay. Um, and they have music nightly. Um, it's yeah. It's actually one of the more successful uh, places on the street. Um, 
but when we were there, you know, we, we were nuts and funny and, and good at what we did. Me and this guy, Bob, was a fiddle player. And um, we would have a line out the door when the bitter end was empty. I mean, we, you know, we were just very big fish in a very small pond, but we were so popular down there. Um, and that went on until 1990, I guess. And then I started getting little, not little parts, but leads in musicals. And I would go out of this, you know, to Iowa or um, Massachusetts in these theaters and do these things. And then, um, but I always come back to the street until it almost killed me. And uh, then that first spring, I wanted nothing to do with the music business, nothing to do with acting, nothing to do with the arts. I just wanted to feel better, live simply. And uh, do you, th you think you associated music with with the with the drink? And oh yeah, and at that point, I think you've heard this story a million times. But I didn't think I could do what I do without being drunk. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, because it does give you a confidence, doesn't it? Whatever. I, yeah, I just. It, yeah. So yeah. So. Um, Oh, this used to be, this used to be woman rink. Um, woman or, yeah, uh, I don't know what they're doing up there on top of this rock, but I saw some amazing concerts down there. Um, That's uh, it's quite a backdrop there, isn't it? With the, yeah. With the older Manhattan, yeah. uh, with, the, with the, the new glass. Oh, that's beautiful. It. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm all over the place, but um, <laughs> but anyways, we're getting there. So so yes, so so um, I think I think you could say this about me. You know, they say you 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 can't you can't scare an alcoholic or a drug addict with death. Um, but for me. Okay, let me just show you real quick. <laughs> this um, used to just be uh, uh, like a, a skating rink, um, but it wasn't it wasn't that, ice. That, it was just like for roller skating, yeah. and there was a stage down there. And I saw like an open air amphitheater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you had tickets, you could sit all there, and then there were uh, uh, raked seating here. But people would just come and sit all on these rocks and stuff. And yeah. I saw the David Bromberg band here, I saw James Taylor here, I saw, it was just, it was magic. It was magic a hundred years ago. Quite a place. So yeah, it's obviously set up as an ice rink today. Is that, is that all year round or is that just... No, that's it, they, in the fall they change it over to this. Yeah. And um, through the Christmas season. There's a lot um, of ice rinks in New York, isn't it? I've noticed that. I went to Rockefeller, there's, there was one there. Well, that, that, that's the big that's the famous, famous one, yeah. yeah. But then I went to a few other places I saw. I think Bryant Park rinks. has one, yeah. Yeah, there was one over the, over the High Line. There was one around Oh, the no way. kidding. Yeah, yeah. Not on the High Line, but below it. Over near there, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this town just keeps changing. I always I always say it's going to be a great town when they finish it. <laughs> well, it's uh, <laughs> long may it continue. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so you've come off the... Um, Come off the street, and now I'm you, you, you're, sober. You're, you're on and the I'm, wagon, as we call yes, it now, aren't yes, you? yes. And uh, and uh, but something after about five months, just maybe I can make a little extra lunch money playing out on the street. And and I, I've told you, I I wasn't writing back then because I had nothing of any importance to say to the world. But I happened to be able to play because of, I hear a song, I can play it. Yeah. And I have a Velcro brain for the lyrics. If a song moves me, it stays with me. Yeah. So I'm out there playing anything people want. So anyway, so I said, let me go to the park and put out a guitar case and make a little extra lunch money. And the first day, um, it's actually over that way on the other side of Woman Rink. Um, I set up, I opened a guitar case, started playing. 10 people gathered. And in about 10, 15 minutes, I just started weeping in front of them uncontrollably. They're looking at me like, what's this about? And I, I was just, I felt like such a loser. I would hear the change hitting the guitar case and I just felt like such a loser. I overwhelmed with whatever. Cried, packed everything up, went home. Um, the next week, 
I must have been very late for something I thought was very important, which I have no idea what it was, but I was in a cab and we stopped at a place in the park as we were cutting through the park. And we stopped at a red light and I looked out and I saw this place where the path, main path went straight and then a little path went down to the lake and back up. And I thought, anybody that doesn't want anything to do with me or the music could just keep walking. And anybody that liked what they heard could go down this little path and I won't be in anybody's face. So the next weekend I, I showed up and there were four or five people sitting on this little grassy knoll. And um, I asked them all if it was okay if I play a few songs and they all said, sure, go ahead. And, and in about every song was right and every word out of my mouth was funny or poignant or whatever, it just, everything was right. And in about an hour from then, there were suddenly 300 people sitting there. And what I didn't know, I played for four or five hours and then what I didn't know that one of the first four people that I asked if it was okay if I play a few songs, um, was a, a man, a beautiful man, named Jack Rosenthal. He was there with his wife or girlfriend at the time, I don't remember. Um, and he had watched this thing happen. But he was a senior editor at the New York Times. Oh, crazy. And so the next, the following day, Monday, January 5th, June 15th, I get this call from an actor friend of mine to tell me, go get the New York Times, go get the New York Times. And there, Jack had written this beautiful article about this spontaneous concert in Central Park. And um, he ended it with something like, uh, people just, old people mellowed in their memories. Young people tapped their feet and laughed and sang. All, oh, because I had played Wild World by Cat Stevens and he said, all certain that it's not a wild world at all. Not on this afternoon in Central Park in New York City. And it was, it was beautiful. Um, and so from that day on, I became that guitar man from Central Park because I said so. <laughs> well, so that was, I suppose, we talked earlier about how things have changed since you started this, but that was, I guess, was what would be described as a viral moment yes. that launched you. Yes, it was just, you know, it was just a magical day, and... What's the chances of that happening as well? That is incredible. I think... I think very... Okay, here we go, back to the... agnostic working on atheism. Yeah. I don't pretend to understand it, and I do not trust people who say they do. But... There's a difference between proof and evidence. Yes. My whole life is evidence that there's something about physical reality resulting as the result of thought or desire. Um, it's just dreaming. If you dream it and you know, I shouldn't say you, so often when I've imagined something, It's become reality. You work towards it, of course. Yes. You, you know, and 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 unapologetically follow whims. Yeah. If I have a hmm idea, it's just an idea. All right. So here's the Plaza Hotel. Um, Incredible building. We can head this way, I think. Yeah. Hug the park. Um, but it's it's my. Uh, it, it's, it's my, not even belief, I don't even know if you call these beliefs anymore, it's the way I live, is that um, my life is constantly being made from my imagination, from, from what I dream. I don't have proof that that's real, but I've got nothing but evidence. Yeah. Um, and I never know exactly how or why. Um, and I heard Paul Simon interviewed the other day and he was talking about the eye, whatever the eye is. I'm also very lucky that I discovered probably 20 years ago, Tim, I'm not a, I'm a creator 
He's so much more than a performer. And people go, you're such a wonderful performer. And I'm like, I think that's because, um, I tell people I was given the gift of mediocrity. <laughs> where it's not gonna get better than this. You know, it's like, this, it's not the greatest thing. And maybe accepting and becoming comfortable with the gift of mediocrity, it makes, in a very paradoxical way, what I do extraordinary. Well, I know you write your own songs because I listened to one coming up, Tom Cruise is Strange. Oh. And then you add in Donald, Donald Trump. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a song that I'll yeah. never get away from. That is, I just thought, it was, I was chuckling to myself on Subway. Thanks. It was absolutely brilliant. All the, all the ones you cover, the Kardashians are strange. And... It, well, actually, everybody, th that song was written to prove to somebody, a woman I was going out with at the time, to prove to her how easy it was to write a really stupid song. Yeah. Um, and something... Do you want to give a, some of the lyrics, maybe, to... Uh, I know you haven't got the guitar. No, it. it was... Yeah, Tom Cruise scares me. How about you? He shouldn't be that scary. He's only five foot two. Um, but ten people saw Mission Impossible 3 because he's always talking about Scientology. Makes an ordinary guy like me say, Tom Cruise scares me. And But what happened was, I didn't know that I had written a perfect template that I could just turn on the news yeah. and write another verse. About anything Kim so use at the time. everybody has been in that song. Yeah. Um, you said Kim Kardashian was in that song. She hasn't been in that song for five years, but I would just change them out every week. Yeah. Um, most well, like your Donald Trump one about his hair. Donald Trump. Well, no, see, that was, that was the only one. There have been 15 oh, verses well, about him. Oh, he's had his own uh, um, changes, has he? Yeah. I think the last, most recent one was something like, Donald Trump scares me, but not as much anymore. Because in the last election, kicked his fat ass out the door. Um, uh, um, oh, I can't remember it now. It was because there have been a lot. Something about the color of his jumpsuit would match his face, and that scares yeah. me. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah. Prison, yes. Oh, that's brilliant. So anyway, it was just, uh, everybody's been in it. Um,